Okay, well, welcome to our consortium series on ethics in research and biotechnology. I'm your host, In Siu Hian. I am the Director of Research Ethics and a faculty member at Harvard Medical School's Center for Bioethics. And I'm the Director of the Center for Life Sciences and Public Learning at the Museum of Science in Boston. As many of you know, uh, who've been following the series, we try to bring together both the science and ethics of emerging biotechnologies and emerging issues in research ethics in general. And many of you already know that the topics we've covered, such as human genome editing, stem cell-based embryo modeling, even our last session on solar geoengineering, all scream for the need for public deliberation, public participation, public engagement. Um, but how best to do that? Well, I decided it would be a good idea to include into the series this topic of deliberative polling and bioethical controversies. So let me just go over some of the ground rules before I introduce our guest. As many of you already know, this is the interactive uh, session. So we're going to have a Q&A uh, portion at the end of Dr. Fishkin's presentation. During the presentation, if as questions come up, uh, please use the Q&A box at the bottom of your Zoom screen, enter your question. Um, only use the chat function if there's a technical issue, you need to get in touch with an administrator. Okay, so the questions go into the Q&A box. After the presentation, I will then uh, pose questions to our speaker and we can then have a back and forth with the audience. Um, so let me introduce our speaker for today. Dr. James Fishkin is joining us from Stanford University where he's a professor of communication, professor of political science by courtesy, and a director of the Center for Deliberative Democracy. He's a fellow of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences, a Guggenheim Fellow, a fellow uh, of the Na Center for Advanced Study in the Behavioral Sciences at Stanford, and a visiting fellow commoner at Trinity College, Cambridge. James received his PhD in political science from Yale, and uh, as well as a second PhD in philosophy from Cambridge University. Um, ever the underachiever, he's only the author of uh, four books, five books. Uh, his books are Democracy, When People Are Thinking, When the People Speak, Deliberation Day with Bruce Ackerman, and Democracy and Deliberation. Uh, he's best known for developing the concept and the practice of deliberative polling, which he'll discuss with us now. Um, so please welcome James Fishkin. James, it's great to have you. The floor is yours. Well, fantastic. Uh, let me pause for a second while I share my screen. And um, uh, where is it? There it is. And uh, if, uh, oh, no. From the beginning. Sorry about that. Uh, uh, I want to make sure that I have the sound. Uh, uh, so I think you want to end your show and then click on your first slide and start from there. Yes, you're right. Let me do that. There we go. Uh, I should say. Those are my books about deliberation. I had the first half of my career was about ethical and political theory on other issues. So, um, but once I thought of this deliberative polling, I could think of nothing else. And so, uh, 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 oh, no, that's, that's the end. Uh, okay, that's not going to. Sorry, I'm messing this up somehow. Uh, well, now you get a quick tour. That's the reduced Shakespeare Company version of the presentation. Okay, so, oh, but I haven't shared my screen, have I? No. <laughs> <laughs> All right, I've really messed this up. All right, let me just get back to the Zoom. I will. Share my screen. And, uh, and start the show from there. Yes. Okay. There you go. Now we're all set. 
and uh, I noticed that 15 people have joined during the time that I messed up the, uh, <laughs> the uh, technology. Uh, I'm from Stanford. I'm supposed to be master of this technology. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, well, you've been obsessed with deliberative democracy, so that's... Yes, uh, that's yes. So, so thank you for the uh, kind introduction. Um, I'm delighted to be here. I am um, going to talk about methods of public consultation, as Insu said. And um, the only slight embarrassment, which is uh, uh, in full disclosure in the um, advertising for this, is that we've been thinking about a project precisely in this area for years and have developed proposals with various collaborators for it. But this is one of the few things, few projects that I've developed that has never happened. So INSU asked me to do this. So I'm going to talk about the method and why it would be appropriate. And uh, we can take it from there. So I'm going to draw on uh, many projects in other fields that we have conducted. So uh, the, um, uh, the idea of using public deliberation on bioethical controversies was in fact uh, endorsed by the Presidential Commission, that was Amy Gutman's commission in 2019, where I was privileged to uh, give testimony, but I was far from the only one who advocated this. And the commission said that the uh, process of... Uh, of uh, I'm sorry, but my headphones aren't working. Uh, is my headphone working? Yes, you're all set. Sorry about that. Continue. Oh, okay. Um, the process of democratic deliberation is especially useful for the types of ethical questions we face in bioethics in which solutions have complex empirical as well as moral bases about which people can disagree. So I'm going to talk about other issues we've done which fit those criteria. Um, and just recently, I published in this um, Hastings Center special report on gene editing in the wild that also made the case for broad public deliberation on ethical questions. And indeed, it was not just me as one of the contributors, but the Hastings Center overall that made this case. So if there's broad public deliberation, it could take many forms. Uh, what is the form that it should take? And what is the ultimate uh, goal of such public deliberation? And uh, in my approach, uh, the um, design uh, is uh, dictated by the goal of finding out what the people would think under, quote, good conditions, unquote, for thinking about the issue. Uh, and we, I want to talk about why that would be needed, how to select the people, uh, how they deliberate, and how to make this practical. So there are lots of public consultations. Uh, and I want to distinguish the method of selection on the, uh, on the uh, top row uh, from the kind of opinion uh, that you may get out of it. Uh, by raw public opinion, I just mean the um, opinions we find in uh, ordinary life where people have not uh, gone through some process to think about it in depth. And refined is a word, sort of a quaint word, but I take it from uh, actually from Madison, who talked about for representatives, uh, the uh, discussions in the Senate and the Constitutional Convention and other areas, uh, refining and enlarging the public views by passing them through the medium of a chosen body of citizens. It's the refinement process that is equivalent to deliberation. But we'll talk about what we mean by deliberation in a moment. My uh, colleague and uh, collaborator, Norman Bradburn from the University of Chicago, coined a term for self-selected uh, uh, raw public opinion um, as uh, slops back in the days when radios would tabulate call-ins. So we called it self-selected listener opinion polls. And the term has now become a widely accepted term. And I, I'm going to say something in a minute as to why we don't want to consult the public through slops you could have self-selected discussion groups, and indeed, the Kettering Foundation, National Issues Forums, and other groups foster public discussion with self-selected groups, 
And that's great in terms of the impact on the citizens, but it doesn't represent the public. Uh, and then there are non-random polls. Uh, there's a, uh, there are broadcasts on TV like Smirconish who do listener polls all the time, but they're self-selected and they don't really mean anything from a scientific standpoint. Uh, and then there are small self-selected uh, groups, citizen juries, uh, and uh, other groups, uh, consensus conferences where the Danes would advertise in the newspapers to get people to volunteer. Now, uh, you might say, why not just do conventional public opinion polls? And it's interesting that uh, Gallup, when he launched the uh, public opinion poll on a national basis, at least in political matters, uh, for the 1936 general election, uh, gave a speech afterwards that the public opinion poll would um, bring the democracy of the New, Engl New England town meeting to the large-scale nation state. And his aspiration was uh, that it would bring representative and informed opinion, which is my aspiration too. But so if you have a scientific sample, you clearly get over some of the problems of self-selection, although of course there's a degree of self-selection in any sample conducted any place but say a prison uh, but uh, the uh, but how aware and how much are, are, are the participants and how thoughtful are they uh, so uh, Gallup's idea was um, uh, the public opi the public opinion poll would bring the democracy of the New England town meeting to the large-scale nation state and there you are in New England but my uh, a uh, colleague, Mo Fiorina, wrote about how the town meeting has been destroyed in New England, in most cases, by the growth in population and the size of the uh, towns. Uh, my friend Jenny Mansbridge did a study of, of a Vermont town, which had 200 and some participants, which she gave a pseudonym to, but most towns are much larger. In any case, um, the um, uh, uh, his uh, Gallup's idea was that uh, radio and newspapers, there wasn't television in those days, would send out competing points of view, and um, uh, the people would think it over, and uh, their views would come back in the form of public opinion poll results, and it would be as if the whole country was in one great room, he said. Um, and there's a well sense in which he was correct. The whole country in one great room, it was so great, it was so big, that uh, nobody was really necessarily paying much attention. Um, and audience democracy, and an audience, we all, we've all gone to talks, perhaps even this one, where you fall asleep in the middle of the talk. So I don't pay much attention to the details. So an audience, we, we need deliberation as an active process, not just a passive process of exposure. So what I call deliberative polling puts the whole country in one room, but it's a room of a human scale by having the scientific sample deliberate. And we improve it slightly, but in the standard way now of having stratified random samples rather than the quota samples that Gallup used. But uh, we have the sample deliberating. Uh, now, of course, in a sense, you could have everybody uh, you can consult everybody, uh, as in a referendum, that's what that, or Bruce Ackerman, uh, my uh, former Yale colleague and friend, uh, and I wrote a book called um, Deliberation Day about the idea of getting everybody to deliberate, which now we are beginning to inch towards with technology, and I'll tell you about that at the end. But I'm going to focus on deliberative polling. James, uh, could you maybe move a little bit away from your microphone because your your sound is a little bit harsh and distorted? Is there a way to make the the sound quality a little bit clearer? Oh well, um, I I don't know. I'm using um, a headphone. Uh, okay, uh, I'll do my best. I would have to exit. I think to oh, no. To, to um, well, just, can, yeah, it's just that it's a little bit distorted when you're speaking because it sounds like you're. Is a little too close to your mouth, wherever the microphone is. Oh well, hangs down from my ear. Um, I could, I could take off the um, the headphone. 
and just speak. No, I, I, I think that's fine. Just, just okay. you may continue. I'll, I'll try not to speak so emphatically. Uh, now, uh, just to say something about the problem of self-selection, isn't that a beautiful bridge, that picture? Uh, that's the bridge that connects um, Buddha and Pest in Hungary. And the country of Hungary decided to have, famously decided to have a, um, uh, a contest for naming it. And uh, they, they, they asked for votes on the internet. And um, they were very surprised when an American comedian named Stephen Colbert decided, saw that picture and said, that's a beautiful bridge. I want it named after me. And he got 10 million or so self-selected votes. Um, and, and so the, uh, he won the, he, he provisionally won the uh, voting. I think when I last looked, there were only something like 7 million people in Hungary. So obviously there are a lot of people who may have voted twice or people who, certainly a lot of Americans who voted. And so the uh, Hungary decided that they, the government decided that they would change the rules and say only if someone, uh, uh, only if someone spoke Hungarian could the bridge be named after them. And so the uh, uh, he then went on TV and showed off his new Hungarian lessons uh, and spoke Hungarian fluently enough to qualify. So then they changed the rules again and decided it would only. Um, they could only uh, name the bridge after someone who was dead, so he withdrew. But it shows that self-selected participation with mobilization and all kinds of interests involved is not, uh, it's very hard for that to be representative of the population in question. It represents the people who are motivated to turn out. And you might say that's part of democracy in some way, but it's not part of our assessing what the pe answering my question, which is what the people would think. So there are basically three problems with public opinion as we find it. Uh, the first is made is rational ignorance, as Anthony Downs coined the term in 1957. If I have one vote in million or one opinion in millions, why should I go to the trouble to think about complex public policy issues? My individual voice, my vote, my opinion will not make any difference. And I've got other things I have to do. I have to uh, do my job. I have to provide for my family, uh, whatever it is. We all have plenty of things where we can, our time can be made more useful than on general public issues. And that's unfortunate because we would like citizens to be well-informed, but that's the condition of the citizen in large-scale mass society. Uh, the second is that many of the opinions that we solicit in uh, polls, uh, there's a, some controversy about how many, but on many complex topics, uh, they are what the great um, public opinion researcher Phil Converse uh, called uh, non-attitudes, or I call them phantom opinions. Uh, the late George Bishop uh, asked the American public what they thought of the Public Affairs Act of 1975, and in polls, some of them supported it and some of them opposed it, but it was fictional. There was no Public Affairs Act of 1975. So the Washington Post famously decided to um, um, ask the public, celebrate the 20th non-anniversary of the non-existent Public Affairs Act of 1975 by asking people what they thought of the repeal of the Public Affairs Act of 1975, and they asked they split the sample telling some people that the Republicans wanted to repeal it and some that the Democrats wanted to repeal it, and they got quite different results. But, of course, it didn't exist in the first place, so it couldn't be repealed. Now, since that time, a, a further problem has developed or has been accentuated, but it was always there, and that is when we do tend to talk to other people about public issues, we tend to talk to people like ourselves, from similar social locations, and often with similar points of view. And the news, uh, we're, now that we have social media and we communicate with our news feeds, we are often in our filter bubbles where the algorithms will feed us uh, views that we agree with and um, 
we can often avoid those that we disagree with, and we can choose cable news channels that we agree with and avoid those that we disagree with. Um, and so in our filter bubbles, uh, we're fostered a communication with the like-minded. So the whole presupposition of a liberal democratic society that, um, that falsehood would be self-correcting, as uh, John Stuart Mill explained in his four cases uh, for why you should tolerate um, uh, disagreement and falsehood, uh, uh, will tend to break down if people never hear the correction. They never hear, they never engage with uh, an evidence-based substantive uh, discussion with each other. They, uh, and um, so uh, uh, we tend to persist in, uh, we're becoming more and more polarized, and some of this polarization is along partisan lines. Uh, now, uh, the method that I employ uh, and that we have employed quite widely now uh, involves, um, uh, speaks to these issues. It involves balanced information. We have a, we have an, we, on the issue that's going to be discussed, we have a, a, a briefing document and then also a video version of the briefing document. But the video, briefing document lays out some proposals for action um, and the pros and cons of those proposals that have been vetted by an advisory group that represents the different points of view on the issue. And that actually is a good part of the work in doing any deliberate, deliberate poll is preparing the materials and vetting them. And that involves a lot of rewriting until everybody is satisfied uh, on the advisory group. So we have the balanced information. We have small group deliberation, moderated small group deliberation, but I'm going to say more about that in a moment. The small groups then engage in um, uh, extensive discussion of the proposals and the pros and cons and any other pros and cons that they think of. And then they formulate key questions that they think might need answering. And those go to panels of, in plenary sessions uh, of, uh, of competing experts who represent different points of view or competing policymakers, usually both, uh, who may have views about the issues. And then the process is repeated going through the agenda. And this usually takes place over a weekend. Uh, and then at the end, people take the same extensive questionnaire that they took at the very beginning. I should have mentioned on first recruitment, we, uh, we have an extensive questionnaire about the policy options and about the pros and cons that we can identify beforehand. Uh, and we also will tend, with permission of the participants, to tape all the small group discussions. And in fact, with new technology, we have the transcriptions instantly, and we can do automated text analysis of the uh, arguments, because we want to see what people conclude and why after they've really thought about it. Uh, so, uh, and where possible, we have control groups who do not deliberate pre-post control groups. So these are actually controlled experiments. And we're interested in deliberative polling is different from many of the other uh, methods of public consultation because we're concerned to have a sample that is uh, large enough that we can analyze the demographic and attitudinal representativeness of the sample in a statistically meaningful way. So these, many of these so-called citizens' assemblies do not uh, produce their results with, um, or, or citizens' juries do not produce their, their conclusions with uh, individual confidential questionnaires. And their sample sizes range from, uh, well, 25 or so for the citizen juries to from 50 to 150 for the for the uh, 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 citizens' assemblies, so-called, which have been conducted in uh, Europe and in Canada, um, in various places, including the U.S. And then also, um, uh, but our projects uh, go up to a thousand persons, uh, uh, or 500, 600, 700. And very quickly, we, we get, um, and that's overall, and then in each small group of 10 or 15, 
uh, people uh, can really discuss, but the aggregate results are statistically meaningful. We can uh, analyze the change. Uh, so uh, we have the representativeness at the start. And why do you want it to be representative of, of the start um, in attitudes as well as demographics? Well, um, if people come in already convinced, uh, uh, then the results may not reflect what the public would think because the overall public is very likely not to have uh, firm views on most issues, particularly relatively complex issues. Uh, and so you want to see where they would go. And people with dem from different demographic groups may have different interests uh, in the issues, and we want to be sure we've covered that. So then we engage them in the opportunity to uh, uh, consider and really discuss the issues um, in an evidence-based way. I really think that that it's the discussion, and we've had some controlled experiments where we show that it's the discussion, not the exposure to information merely, but it's the discussion. If you expose people to information that they disagree with at the start, you may just trigger a negative response. But if you engage them in a discussion with diverse others, you often get very surprising changes. Uh, and in any case, uh, uh, we also measure knowledge to see if the people have become more informed. And there are certain distortions that we're very interested in studying and have not found in the deliberative poll. Uh, and we, uh, we now have a, uh, uh, a paper that's been accepted by the British Journal of Political Science, which looks at a large number of uh, deliberative polls and an even larger number of small groups, because each deliberative poll may have 20, 30, 40, 50, or as in the climate change uh, project I'm going to discuss, a hundred small groups. And we look at the uh, uh, whether uh, uh, the uh, movements are in the direction supported by the most advantaged, the most educated, uh, the men rather than the women, the rich rather than the poor. And nothing like that is the case. Uh, the, uh, there's, there's no such pattern of movement that the, the the more advantaged, not imposing their views on the less advantaged. Um, everybody is participating equally. Uh, well, anyway, let me let me see. Oh, here we see. Well, this lists 110 uh, projects in 34 countries. Actually, this is out of date. It's now more like 115 projects, uh, and I think the uh, number of countries is even larger on every inhabited continent. Even we've done this all over Africa, uh, 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 Ghana, Uganda, Senegal, Malawi, uh, Tanzania. We've done it in Asia, um, uh, European-wide, I'll show you. So I'll show you a few such cases. But we've done this all over the world in developed countries, developing countries. And, um, and we've done it, oh, this was the, I'm not going to play the video for this, but this was the very first project. Uh, and it was on, um, it was in the United Kingdom, uh, it was in Britain, on crime. Um, uh, we didn't have Northern Ireland, so I won't say it's the whole United Kingdom. But um, the, uh, and it was about, and I remember it very clearly, it goes all the way back to 1994, soon after I had the idea of uh, consulting the public in this way. And um, a woman came up to me who was a spouse accompanying her husband. We allowed the spouses to come as observers, but you had to be uh, selected to be in the sample, so the observers couldn't participate. Um, and she, but she said she wanted to thank me because in 30 years of marriage, her husband had never read a newspaper. And um, But from the moment that he was selected to come to this, she said, he began reading every newspaper every day, and he was going to be much more interesting to live with in retirement. And to me, that encapsulated that we were providing a response to the problem of rational ignorance. That is, um, uh, he, uh, uh, he was effectively motivated to prepare and to think about uh, public issues um, in preparation, because instead of one opinion in millions, he had one opinion 
who's going to have one opinion in a discussion group of 10 or 15 um, and in a sample of three or 400. And he was, um, and we went back to these people a year later and they were still even more informed than they were at the end of the weekend. And by the way, they did change their views on many contested issues. Uh, we published that also in the British Journal of Political Science. And there's a video on our website because Channel 4 made a two-hour program about it. But that was the launch of this whole initiative. And it led to all kinds of things. That's the European Union uh, Parliament building. But those people are the sample of uh, the first of two um, European-wide deliberative polls conducted in 22 languages. You can see the headphones of the people. Uh, and that's the plenary session uh, and with the questions to competing experts. Uh, the uh, small groups where, where uh, 10 or 15 people also with headphones. And we had, it was very complex to work out the, um, uh, uh, the uh, pivot languages for the uh, interpreters uh, in order to cover all the languages. Uh, now, uh, this was a series of projects uh, on um, uh, the provision of uh, uh, electricity in Texas. We did eight such projects. And this is a case where um, there are, uh, uh, it's, it's a combination of empirical questions and values, um, and where the deliberative poll had a direct impact on policy. Uh, because at the time that we started this, Texas was last among the 50 states in uh, renewable energy. Uh, uh, and um, by the time we ended, uh, Texas. Uh, shot from number 50 to number one. Um, and what really caught the attention of the Public Utility Commission, who cooperated, who helped uh, organize the projects along with the eight then regulated electric utilities, was the percentage of the public willing to pay more on their bill in order to, um, in order to um, uh, support uh, wind power. Uh, wind or solar power, but it was basically wind power at that point. And now, of course, the cost of wind power has gone down to the point where you don't have to subsidize it. But at that point, it was just people were willing to pay um, uh, uh, a dollar more, two dollars more, five dollars more, uh, something more on, on their bill. And uh, so the Public Utility Commission assessed everybody 25 cents, and you might say, what is that? But when you have millions of quarters, the, the 25 cents um, really sparked the development of wind power in Texas, um, and it just has kept going. So in two th by 2007, Texas surpassed California as the leading state in wind power, and it's only, uh, it's, it's only increased its lead among the states. Wind power all over the Davis Mountains and other places in Texas has uh, uh, Texas is the, is the leader in the U.S. and one of the world leaders. And it's because the public bought into this on reflection when before many people had not even thought of wind power. In fact, the initial questions in uh, Phil Converse's uh, uh, study where he proposed the non-attitudes came from questions about public utility issues where the public couldn't even remember in a panel study from 1956 to 1960 what they had said the previous year. And so Converse concluded that people were answering questions, but there was no actual opinion there. It just varied randomly from year to year over the four years. So I took particular satisfaction since Converse was one of the people who helped us bring the deliberative poll to the United States uh, on a national basis uh, that we um, uh, were able in that policy domain of what to do with electric utilities, um, we were able to show that people, instead of non-attitudes, could formulate thoughtful opinions uh, that were consistent with their other opinions uh, as they changed their views before and after deliberation. Uh, sometimes we had very controversial issues with ethnic differences. In um, uh, We did a national project in Bulgaria about uh, uh, the condition of the Roma, 
and this was I'm mentioning this because it was consequential for policy. Uh, that is the um, uh, the 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 Roma children uh, went to schools that were segregated, um, and um, there's a lot of prejudice towards the Roma in Bulgaria, as there is throughout Eastern Europe. And um, the in this project, the percentage of the people, to everyone's surprise, who were willing to close the Roma-only schools and bus the children uh, to schools with everybody else went from 42 to uh, 66%. And the percentage who wanted to preserve the current Roma schools, um, uh, which were terrible schools on all the evidence, went down from 46 to 24%. Well, our Bulgarian partners tell us that this uh, national project, which the prime minister um, uh, attended and was interviewed in the New York Times about, um, uh, was the catalyst uh, in the long... Uh, uh, struggle to get the Roma only schools desegregated, which they are now desegregated. Um, and now, here's an example of another issue in Japan, which was also policy consequential, where uh, the Japanese were about to um, privatize their pension system. And you might say pensions are quite, you know, different from this. Um, uh, the areas that you're, this group is ultimately interested in, bioethics. Nevertheless, uh, there, um, it's very consequential and very complicated, but um, uh, the, uh, the ordinary polls were, um, uh, oh, the, the Japanese called the private account system that was being proposed, which is like the Chilean system, where uh, uh, the uh, called the, the funded uh, system, I thought misleadingly, because uh, everybody would have their own fund. And support in public opinion polls for that was it's about 70% in uh, many polls at the time the government was about to act. And in our poll at the beginning, it was 69%. And when people deliberated, it fell precipitously to 30 to 5%. Uh, and um, because the public in the deliberations, when they realized that they would be responsible for investing their pensions in the stock market, they didn't like the uh, insecurity. They didn't like the risk of having their retirement uh, uh, vary with the, they wanted something uh, secure. So rather they supported increasing the consumption tax, which was very low, it's uh, like a national sales tax, uh, if the provided only that the money would uh, go into the pension system. And you know how hard it is to get people to support an increase in taxes. In any case, uh, the, uh, uh, this uh, project had a lot of media support. Uh, 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 Asahi Shinbun, uh, which is sort of the New York Times of Japan, uh, featured it a lot. And uh, NHK was a partner that a public broadcaster, um, and um, the uh, the government at the time uh, 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 dropped the proposal for uh, the uh, privatization, and uh, the uh, 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 the next government that came in continued that, and so this had a a, a clear effect on the uh, policy making. Uh, Japan also did. Uh, after the Fukushima disaster, commissioned officially uh, the other project with our partners at Keio University um, uh, was um, funded by the equivalent of the National Science Foundation there. But uh, this project uh, at the National Deliberative Poll on Energy after the Fukushima disaster was explicitly published, uh, sponsored by uh, the government. And interestingly, the uh, uh, the government did everything else before they did the deliberative poll. They did ordinary polls, but they couldn't tell how much the public really understood the issues from conventional polling. And the issues were very complicated. Um, and then the, um, uh, they had open town meetings, so-called, around the country, 
and we're very surprised that um, the um, uh, anti-nuclear activists showed out in force at the same time that the uh, then the electricity companies uh, uh, showed out in force, um, and they yelled at each other. And so the town meetings all around the country were a kind of circus that was covered in the press around the country, but it, it didn't enlighten very much. So then they, um, they did, um, uh, with a scientific sample, they did uh, a deliberate poll with our collaboration with our uh, colleagues at Keio University in Tokyo, and uh, we uh, got results that they found useful. Uh, by the way, nuclear energy is another thing that's continued in South Korea. We were very surprised that President Moon decided that since he was um, stuck with two nuclear um, reactors when he came into office that were partially constructed, he uh, announced that um, uh, there would be a deliberate poll and that would have the final say on whether the reactors were finished or not. Uh, his party position, he was, was basically anti-nuclear, but there were consequences for uh, climate change and for the cost of electricity if the nuclear reactors um, uh, did not come on board and they had to um, uh, import fossil fuels. And so it was a difficult choice. And the root of deliberation is really weighing, uh, weigh, uh, weighing the competing arguments. And this one... And in this one, uh, everyone was surprised, or a lot of people were surprised, that the uh, people in the sample uh, moved to support uh, the completion of the two nuclear reactors. Uh, and then they've gone on to do some others as well since. Uh, another uh, unusual example, which, again, is a little far afield from bioethics, but I think it's very consequential, We've done some projects in Mongolia, and Mongolia has changed its its changed the law on constitutional amendments so that before they are permitted to do a constitutional amendment, they have to um, uh, have a national sample with a deliberative poll. And here's the deliberative poll of about 700 citizens selected meticulously by the National Statistical Office, the same office that does the census. And with an extraordinarily high response rate, people were brought from all over the country to the capital, uh, Ulaanbaatar, and um, to the um, uh, uh, government palace, which you see there. Uh, and the sample is gathered for a picture under the uh, statue of Genghis Khan, which uh, 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 dominates not only the parliament, but a lot of um, the uh, uh, the uh, political culture in uh, at least uh, is is a revered figure in Mongolia, and they did actually uh, make some consequential decisions as recommendations to the parliament, and uh, the parliament took them on board. And according to the speaker of the parliament, the decisions of the deliberative poll were absolutely crucial in their fashioning an amendment, which then actually passed the parliament by two thirds. So. It's, we successfully helped them to change the Constitution. Uh, uh, now, uh, in, I don't, uh, how much time do I have left? I may have talked too long. Uh, um, so I'd like to get to the Q&A in about 15 minutes. Is that okay, possible? good. Okay, so I will zip through some things. Uh, here's what I'd like to do. Um, uh, so this is a project called America in One Room, uh, uh, which we did on the eve of the... Um, primaries uh, 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 the, uh, in the eve of the primaries in 2019. And it, we had uh, NORC at the University of Chicago uh, provided a sample of uh, more than 500 uh, registered voters. We discussed in depth for a weekend these five issues. Uh, and um, by the way, the New York Times did us the favor of putting the photos of all the participants uh, in the newspaper, with permission, of course, uh, saying this is what America looks like. And, uh, and look how they, after a weekend of deliberation, how they changed on some of the most controversial issues. 
For example, uh, uh, look at immigration here. This was published in the Times. Support for forcing undocumented immigrants to return to their home countries before applying to live and work in the U.S. The Republicans, uh, before deliberation, supported that 79%. After deliberation, only 40%. That's a 39-point drop. That is an earthquake in public opinion. Uh, support for DACA went way up. Uh, support for reducing the number of refugees allowed to resettle in the U.S. dropped from 66 to 34 um, percent, et cetera. We got a lot of very large changes of opinion. And uh, the Democrats also changed in a very large way. Remember, this is before COVID. Uh, so support for uh, uh, opposition to universal basic income went up dramatically. Support for a government-funded baby bond for use in education or other purposes, which they thought was a kind of uh, giveaway, went also down 40 points. Support for Medicare for All went down uh, 14 points from 70% to 56%. I think as people thought about uh, the problems, they didn't want to give up their private health insurance. So um, the Democrats changed dramatically. The Republicans changed dramatically. I don't necessarily agree or disagree with any of these results personally, but we, they had coherent reasons, which, and we, we found to, um, uh, that overall the uh, deliberation sharply depolarized extreme partisan polarization as people came to a view on the substance of the issues. Now, we did a similar project on climate and energy, and we used technology that I'm going to describe to you uh, we had almost a thousand deliberators and um, a control group of 670, and um, and they did it online, uh, and uh, we got very dramatic. We had a great sample uh, that NORC at the University of Chicago got us, and on 70 there were 72 substantive questions, and 68 of them changed significantly, and 66 out of the 68 changed significantly in the direction of doing more to combat climate change. Uh, and um, uh, the, uh, uh, once, once they got over the threshold question of um, uh, whether climate change was real and whether humans had a role in producing it, uh, the, uh, again here the action, uh, a lot of the action was with the Republicans who on all of these uh, questions, about 35% would um, thought it was real or would support doing something on uh, getting rid of coal or uh, 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 supporting innovations for electric cars and all of these. Uh, as I said, we had 68, uh, we had 72 uh, proposals. Uh, so about 35% before and about 55% afterwards. It was very consistent. Uh, and so uh, the Democrats tended to go, started high and went even higher. The independents uh, uh, went higher. And the Republicans went higher from minority to majority as they thought through the complexities. And many of these, you know, uh, 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 carbon capture and sequestration, uh, biofuels, we went through uh, all of the um, uh, 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 and strategies for reaching net zero. It is very complicated. I'm not going to go through these slides since I've already I've talked too much except uh, investments in solar energy. Nuclear was surprisingly supported by almost everybody, or it was not a partisan issue. Um, and uh, what I want to uh, mention is that we use this platform, with collaboration with um, uh, my colleague from Management Science and Engineer, Engineering, Ashish Goel, uh, who has uh, a, a, a center called the Crowdsource Democracy Team, and then uh, my Center for Deliberative Democracy, we've developed an automated platform. And what this does is it allows a group to moderate itself. You can see it on, in the bottom screen. Whoever's speaking has the picture enlarged. Uh, and it randomly assigns the participants to uh, small groups of about 10. 
but it does a number of things. It, um, uh, it has a speaking queue. People who want to speak volunteer for the queue. Uh, uh, each uh, speech is limited to 45 seconds, although it can be briefly interrupted if somebody has to make a point uh, directly. Um, uh, it shows the pros and cons for that proposal on one side of the screen. Um, uh, and it asks the participants um, when they think they have um, covered the agenda for that proposal and would they like to move on or would they like to discuss it further. Uh, and it moves through, moves the discussion very efficiently through all the proposals. It nudges people who have not spoken, invites them to speak. Um, it intervenes if people are being uncivil to each other. Um, and it orchestrates their uh, decision about the most important questions that they want to ask in the plenary sessions. Um, as they invite people to enter a question, then others to edit uh, the uh, proposal, and then they vote uh, with ranked choice voting among the um, different proposals until they get it down to two questions that are suggested, which are passed on to the uh, uh, moderator, uh, the human moderator of the plenary session. Uh, and um, we use this, uh, uh, of the, this Voices of the Future is a national sample that we did of young people uh, on uh, public policy, uh, on political issues, political reform issues. We used it nationally in Canada. Uh, we used it nationally in Chile on pensions and health care reform, in a project commissioned by the Chilean parliament. Uh, and, um, and, and uh, heavily uh, covered by CNN, I should add. Um, we did um, a, um, uh, we've used it in Hong Kong and in Tokyo. Um, and in the climate change project, we used it. Um, and uh, the, um, because we have the uh, transcripts, it is really facilitated our using the, um, uh, are getting the qualitative as well as qualitative material about the, uh, the, uh, uh, the project here. Let me just show you this, this two minute video about the, uh, uh, this is a two minute video that shows you just a little bit about the, um, the platform. Uh, but I wanna say the implication of the platform is that when we find people deliberate together, particularly on issues they disagree about, as well as issues they haven't thought much about, uh, we help create uh, more informed citizens who have a greater sense of efficacy, who are much more likely to vote, who are much more likely to think about the issues when they vote. We have data on that that I'll come to if, if you ask me about it. Um, and um, they... Um, so we'd like to spread this. Uh, so we're now going to open up use of the platform to civic groups, and uh, we've got an undertaking with um, uh, universities and colleges around the country um, to um, spread deliberation. Um, and we think eventually we want to build up to, and we've just gotten some, raised some money to experiment with scaling with the mass public. We think we could have thousands, tens of thousands, there's no limit to the number who could deliberate on the platform. So we'd like to actually change public opinion in whatever way the thoughtful and informed participants arrive at uh, through the platform. So that's our scaling activity. And we're going to start experimenting with that on the issue of climate change, but we're also going to use it for other issues. So I'm going to just show you this short video, um, which gives you a picture of the platform and it draws, it, it excerpts particular people who were talking on the platform, but it's, um, uh, uh, it's about climate change. But climate change is a contested issue. It's, we, it turned out to be a surprisingly partisan issue. We found um, 33 of our 68 proposals uh, exhibited extreme partisan polarization in terms of the distribution of opinion on one side or the other. Um, and so um, uh, we, we think it's worth scaling. So let's see if this video works here.
Good morning, I'm Eric. Hi, I'm Rayanne, I'm from Tennessee. And my name is Ken. Hi, I'm Carrie. Hi, I'm Barbara. Hi, I'm Lauren, uh, I live in Southern California. Hi, I'm Sean, I work in aerospace manufacturing in Washington. Good morning, I'm Wasa Harvey. Thank you all for joining today. This discussion is an opportunity for everyone to learn. I want to encourage everyone to speak freely. Please respect and listen to each other's opinions and try not to interrupt others. I do think we need to reduce greenhouse emissions, but I'm not sure how practical it is to totally eliminate a lot of these things. You guys can hear me, right? Okay, good. The hollow promise of net zero carbon pledges. And the key, the key message here is, unfortunately, there are no standard guidelines for achieving net zero carbon neutral emissions. And it feels kind of disingenuous for us to try and regulate other countries when it's still a matter of debate here. Try to convince me. <laughs> uh, maybe I'm a minority of one on this panel, but that uh, there really is nothing that, that human beings can do to tilt climate in one way or the other. The tax breaks for Tesla owners and that those types of policies have come into places because we don't have a lot of low-income people making our laws and policies. As a libertarian, I hate to agree with you. Coal is going away naturally on its own. It's so slow. Uh, these other things, gasoline-powered cars. So really the issue is not whether it will happen, but how can we speed it up? Most people are saying that a tax on methane is unnecessary. I don't have that answer. It's, I'm just throwing that out there. Most people, most of the time, are not motivated to become informed about complex issues. Furthermore, if they do talk about these issues or consult the media, they consult congenial sources, like-minded people. So they never hear the other side. They fought, they deliberated, they weighed with one another, and they changed on a great many of these items, not only in statistically significant ways, but in substantively, often very large ways. So you see these amazing individual examples and anecdotes of people changing their minds, not because a politician is scolding them to do so, but actually the opposite, that they're being empowered to learn about this information for themselves and come up with an emergent opinion that may or may not differ from the party line or dogma. I joined the uh, project, uh, hopefully, to, to learn um, and to maybe contribute some things. And I, and I did learn. Uh, I, I found out that there were a lot of people uh, who had my concerns. When we first started, we felt like, oh boy, you know, this is not gonna work, you know, because everybody brings uh, their ideas to the table. But we did come to a conclusion that yes, this will work uh, if we work it together. Okay, so so I'm available for for questions, Insu. Fantastic! Thank you so much. And that was such a uh, breathtaking array of examples of deliberative polling in the past. Uh, I'm going to just start things off with um, a, um, a concept you brought up at the very beginning that I thought was intriguing. Right? It's the concept of rational ignorance. Look, I'm busy. I have an I have my own opinion. Uh, I only have one vote. Uh, why would I spend all this time hearing these uh, other, you know, opinions and hearing about these other um, factoids when uh, when I'm busy? So, how do you get over that um, that tendency that people may have, even in the deliberative polling approach? I mean, it looks like your examples involve like a day or two mm -hmm. of, of commitment. Uh, how do you get over the rational ignorance inertia? Well, uh, you have to uh, convince people that their voice will matter in this in a way that it would not otherwise, um, and that it will be very enjoyable. They will get to meet people very different from themselves, which normally people never do. Um, and that, um, uh, so uh, we normally 
pay a modest honorarium. Uh, in the uh, face-to-face projects you saw, we were all for also paying for all their expenses. Uh, and so that was the free trip and the rest of it. But in the, um, in the online projects, uh, we pay a modest fee, but it's just to help facilitate the participation of the um, uh, economically uh, uh, less well-off. Uh, but, um, and so it's certainly not the reason that people participate. We, we convince them that the issue is important and that their voice matters. And uh, we usually try to find a context where something will be done with the results and uh, uh, also that the media will cover it. Um, and we have a good track record in getting a lot of media. And um, so people participate for a variety of reasons, uh, as long as you make it easy for them. Um, and I think there's a lot of people who are tired of being manipulated and getting uh, uh, the uh, uh, people trying to sell them something uh, or uh, uh, convince them to buy something, and if you uh, appeal to them, well, can you help us in thinking through these public problems and thinking through how the public, um, which ones the public will support and which ones they don't, and your voice will matter to this project. Your voice is really important because you've been selected, and if you don't participate, it will be less representative. Uh, uh, and we, you know, are persistent enough. Uh, we often can get can get them to start, and once they start, they always finish. Uh, mm-hmm. Almost nobody drops out. They find it very interesting and intriguing, and that applies to the face to face and to the online. In the Chilean four hundred uh, project, which was done with this platform because it happened during COVID, uh, it actually ended up being the Chilean five hundred. But they picked the name four hundred against my advice. Uh, but they had 500 participants. Uh, the people were uh, uh, crying at the end that they had to stop, even though they'd spent a whole weekend, because they bonded in their groups, and they became fast friends, and they exchanged their, their contacts, and they wanted to have reunions, and et cetera, et cetera. So um, uh, we, we find that we can get people to participate, uh, and we, uh, or at least try it, and if they do, they like it. Uh, mm-hmm. um, so questions are coming in. I'm going to first start with questions that kind of, again, have to do a little bit more with deliberative polling in general, and then get to questions that relate more to bioethics. Um, so Judy Friedson asks, um, what are the critical components of conducting a deliberative poll? And what is your definition of a successful outcome? Well, um, I had a slide about that, but uh, let me just say that um, uh, first, the first thing I ask if an organization uh, uh, contacts us and wants to conduct one of these is uh, a clear statement of the issues, the policy proposals that might be considered, uh, and a committee that can vet briefing materials that uh, are balanced and evidence-based about the pros and cons of, uh, of each of those proposals. And once we have that, it's very easy to, con- to construct a questionnaire about those same proposals. And from the pros and cons, uh, the ex- possible explanatory variables that might explain the reasons why somebody might support or oppose uh, those proposals. And then we're off to the races. Then we just have to get a way of getting the sample uh, and uh, a stratified random sample of the population in question. It could be a city, a state, a country, or as I pointed out, the entire European Union. Uh, but then uh, uh, you, need, um, uh, uh, you need a method for recruiting the sample and getting them to participate and collecting the data before and after. Now, the criteria for success involve the representativeness of the sample, uh, and the, um, uh, I won't say specifically that the opinion changes are a criterion for success, because um, uh, there may be a case where people have an impression that they that they will lean one way on an issue, but it's an uninformed impression. And then after the process, 
they ha they're well informed about the competing arguments, and they might or might not come out the same way. But if they come out the same way, it's based on reasons at the end. So reason-based considered judgments, but also the easiest way to communicate this is when we have uh, substantial opinion changes, substantial and statistically significant opinion changes, so that we can say it's not just some arbitrary change, but you saw the magnitude of the changes that I saw, and they were many of them were quite astonishing. Um, and so the, the opinion changes, and then we have questions about knowledge, and we, we almost always get significant increases in knowledge. We also get um, uh, significant increases in uh, mutual respect um, and um, uh, uh, in, in um, uh, trust questions. And in, uh, uh, we lower um, affective polarization. Uh, the, uh, the, um, the, the extreme um, uh, dislike between Republicans and Democrats usually diminishes uh, significantly in these processes. And then, um, uh, so, so um, these are all criteria for whether it's a successful uh, deliberation. James, do you measure how long um, this change persists in people? So, so we have we have big shifts. Do you do you do you see whether that is kind of like a the warm fuzzy glove? I've just gone through this process. I bonded with my deliberators. Is it does that last? Does does the does the change in view last? Well, uh, no and yes. Um, we in that American one room uh, project. We often don't have the money to go back. But in that American One Room project that you saw, the face-to-face -face one, uh, we went back uh, at the time of the election uh, with, in collaboration with the New York Times because uh, they wanted to know how the people voted. And um, we also uh, uh, had, had, a, had a survey around the time of the um, uh, party conventions. Uh, so we went nine months and a year later. And many of the policy attitudes went reverted back a good deal, not completely. And among the most, those who took the most extreme positions, uh, there was still significant um, persistence of the changes because those who took the most extreme positions moved uh, significantly closer together. Uh, but uh, something else very dramatic happened, which we've now presented at the American Political Science Association meetings and now submitted it for publication. Uh, because, um, and the New York Times published it, so I can talk about it. And it was very surprising. It took them a while to publish it because they checked it out because it was so very surprising. The uh, uh, the voting intention, well, let, let me put it this way. The, the people who deliberated compared to the control group, and we got very good because NORC was doing it. Um, they got uh, very good com completions from both the participants and the control group. And this is now posted on our website as the um, uh, American One Room election follow-up. Um, so the participants, um, uh, uh, were much more aware of the campaign as it unfolded. They continued to become increasingly knowledgeable. Those who changed their views on the weekend, um, uh, uh, oh, oh, they also they also became uh, had a much greater sense of efficacy that they thought their voices mattered. Um, and those who changed on the weekend um, moved uh, dramatically to support Biden rather than Trump, regardless. Uh, and so, so the, the control group got the election in a national uh, results almost perfectly. Uh, I think, I can't remember, 3.5%, 4% .5%, for Biden over Trump. But the, um, the treatment group, the participants were, uh, I think almost 29 points. It, it was, it's on there. I mean, a tremendous uh, gap in terms of support for Biden instead of Trump uh, was uh, almost, you know, um, 
it, it was so big that people wouldn't believe it. Um, uh, uh, now, and we, we, asked, we wondered if was this COVID, uh, but if you look at COVID, COVID was a factor for everybody. COVID was everywhere. COVID didn't distinguish the uh, participants from the control group. So anyway, there was a big gap, um, and the participants went dramatically for Biden rather than Trump. And the actual details are there on our website. I'm now forgetting, and I don't want to. I don't want to misquote it, but it was gigantic. But we then checked um, in balance tables. There's the 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 ratio of um, uh, the 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 participant sample. Though it's not attrition that explains um, the gap. Uh, and we sorted that out um, in the paper pretty um, uh, clearly. It was the um, effect of the deliberation. And we think um, we have a causal mediation analysis where, uh, in our view, deliberating in the deliberative poll created a kind of civic engagement uh, mediating variable, which uh, the people just became more uh, uh, informed, more aware of the campaign. Um, uh, had a greater sense of efficacy uh, and took account of their policy positions more. And those are the people who uh, voted for uh, Biden rather than Trump, particularly in the broad middle range, uh, where in the control group, many of them didn't vote at all. But in the treatment group, uh, they were motivated to vote. The, having participated in this made them much more likely to vote. And um, it was those people in the broad middle who often don't pay attention and uh, 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 and it was somewhat more women than men but it was everybody really so we had a tremendous lasting effect in fact so tremendous that um, but the times checked it out in the the upshot team checked it out and then they published it um, and they published the pictures of the people again in the paper uh, uh, so the so the people who participated got their pictures in the New York Times twice. Uh, uh, so, so yes, this can have a big lasting effect. Um, and that's why we're, and that was part of our case for wanting to scale the deliberative process. Yeah, I, I want to move Sanchi some bioethics related questions, but a couple of comments that I think follow up very nicely what you just said. So Alan Regenberg, hey Alan, uh, he, wanted, he wants to know, um, the participants who, um, are involved in this? Is there like a process where they might you might be planting seeds for broader discussions? Maybe with you know them bringing home these deliberations to their friends and their family. Have you looked at this sort of impact of your projects? Um, you know, sort of the sort of like you know um, uh, their participants bringing the conversations home and, and continuing it with their friends and family. No, but we'd like to do that, um, and indeed uh, that's part of the plan. We've just gotten a lot of money, well, a lot of money, but a significant amount of money to uh, experiment with and prototype scaling the deliberations to much larger numbers. And with those resources, our, um, our uh, hunch is that since people are always saying they love the process, and can they bring their friends and family, can they recommend it to others, we're going to test that to see if they would recommend it to others and see if we can scale it to much larger numbers of others this is not something we would ever do for a deliberative poll, because for a deliberative poll, we want to be very careful who's in the sample. Uh, but for scaling deliberation to the broader public, it's essential for spreading this virally. So, so um, your, uh, your question um, uh, foreshadows uh, the research that we want to start doing now, and we're going to be doing controlled experiments where that's part of the aim. Uh, we're going to uh, we're going to see if 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 the people are willing to uh, recommend and follow through, and if we can then scale it. Uh, so so that's our next that's our next frontier. Okay. Uh, one last general question before the bioethics questions, and if you can answer this briefly, Anna Lewis. Hi, Anna. Anna, she asks, uh, but how much is the cost to do a deliberative poll, and what are the main components that drive that cost? Well. First, you have to distinguish the country. I mean, when we, the projects we did in uh, Uganda and Ghana and um, uh, places like that, the costs were uh, quite minimal by uh, U.S. standards. Uh, the, uh, 
those were face-to-face -face projects. The, uh, pro the, the cost of uh, a national U.S. project, um, uh, most of the cost w is taken up with uh, airplane travel and uh, hotels and food. Uh, so um, if you do it online, you eliminate all of that. Uh, so then it's a question of the, um, so with the use of the platform, uh, it's actually uh, quite cheap, except depends how much it costs to, to get the advisory group going through a lot of meetings so that they approve the materials and the rest. And then, uh, then the costs are basically the survey firm recruiting the sample, uh, whatever incentives we paid to the people. Um, and that, so we were able to do, um, uh, uh, a, uh, a much, um, uh, and then, and then of course, this will also vary, um, uh, well, in, in any case, uh, uh, there's clearly a few hundred thousand dollars for a national sample to actually deliberate and a control group to do a, um, uh, 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 I mean, the climate change one, you know, we had a thousand people instead of the 500 people, and we had a control group. Uh, and the rest, and we had incentives that we decided to pay them, um, and we paid uh, three hundred dollars a person for the weekend. Um, but uh, we could. Uh, uh, there are some places where we could pay less. Um, I think in Canada they paid significantly less, and it was very effective. Um, and uh, so the costs have varied. Uh, that was also done on the platform. The costs have varied, but it's clearly going to be a few hundred thousand dollars. Uh, but you have to. You have to tailor it to the situation, uh, the country, uh, and uh, the cost of recruiting. Now, um, to get a good sample. Uh, okay, um, so I want to move to some of the ethics and bioethics questions that have come in. There are a lot of them. So uh, if you can provide brief answers, if possible, uh, we'll try to get through as many of these questions as we can. Uh, Takunda Matosi asks, um, and this is, I think, a good question to start bringing up with ethical uses, because um, obviously you've been dealing with public policy questions, um, political issues, but uh, Takunda asks, uh, instead of, I'm paraphrasing, instead of maybe, you know, looking at uh, consensus building and decision making, do you think some of these deliberative polls can actually get at, quote unquote, something like the right answer ethically? I, I think he means ethically, correct answer. Um, is there a role for using deliberative polling to arrive at correct answers to ethical controversies? Well, I'm not an epistemic deliberationist. There are some who are, but I'm certainly not a relativist either. What I am is I'm facilitating the public will. And some people will interpret that as getting the right answer, but it's the right answer for a population after they've really thought about the competing arguments. So, um, uh, there are people who will bring arguments, uh, uh, and as they weigh the arguments and revise their own views, uh, uh, it's uh, so it's public opinion and public will formation. So it's very Habermasian in spirit, uh, uh, but uh, I don't want to take the step of saying that um, it's the right answer, but it's it's the it's the answer that really has purchase on this population that they are willing to buy into as what they would approve. Um, and uh, uh, so, um, uh, uh, you know, I spent a lot of years uh, writing, uh, uh, doing ethics and political theory. So I, um, I, I'm not, but I'm not going to take that last step. I'm going to say this is, this is the right answer for that population that they're willing to endorse. And here are the reasons that they think have weight. Um, and um, that should be good enough for policymaking. Okay, great. So Barbara Koenig, hi, Barbara. Um, she has two questions. I'm going to start with her second question first. Um, do you think bioethics questions present any particular challenges as opposed to other topics such as climate change or environmental policies? I know you haven't gotten into the bioethical issues yet, but do you think bioethical questions pose particular challenges for this? Well, uh, yeah, they do pose challenges, maybe risk challenges, um, um, but we, do, we deal with risk all the time in other policy areas. Um, I think that... Um, um, I think there are uh, uh, 
sometimes we do projects that seem to turn on what we call empirical premises. If, if, if you do this, that will happen. If you do that, this other thing will happen. Well, depending upon the risks and benefits of those causal claims and whether how transparent they can be or how much it's a step into the unknown, uh, that can complicate the analysis. But um, uh, apart from that, I think that, um, that there are, most of our deliberations have to do with competing value-laden goals. Uh, and uh, I emphasize value-laden goals, uh, not just the values in general, but the goals of policies with, that, that have, uh, and the competing values that attach to them. And I think the bioethics questions fit into that quite well. And that was what the Presidential Commission uh, concluded, uh, as, uh, which I take as a, uh, which I've used in trying to raise funds for this kind of project, because I think this is a really important area. Yeah, Barbara just added an important point. She says uh, identifying persistent disagreements may be another important outcome. But let me move to our other question. Um, do you think, can you come up with any examples that people have used the deliberative, not your approach, but a deliberate approach to a bioethical issue that you think is a good case study? Well, no, because um, most of the other processes don't collect the opinions in confidential questionnaires. They have a group spend a lot more time than a weekend, sometimes up to a year, writing a report that is a shared consensus document. Uh, and so that makes it impossible to study the opinion changes. And I think it, impose, it exposes the people to social pressures to go along with the group, as in uh, getting a verdict in a jury. Uh, now, I, I actually have written about the jury, and it's an important institution in our civic life. But I think for this purpose, you really want to protect the autonomy of the individual opinions. So I don't actually, uh, that, this is one of the reasons that I support this particular model uh, rather than the other models. Uh, so, so with our model, we have uh, only a weekend, but we have the uh, confidential questionnaires and we have the opinion changes. And we do a lot to try to protect the opinions from the social pressure that you get in small groups. And that's why the small group analyses have turned out so well. Yeah, some of the some classic of the work, early work in um, deliberate democracy, I'm thinking here about Amy Gutman and Dennis Thompson, um, they have a, 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 a stricture that only people can uh, bring their publicly accessible reasons to the deliberation table, right? So you can't like appeal to faith claims about God, things that cannot be scrutinized from other uh, participants in a publicly accessible way that don't share those same faith commitments. Um, how do you deal in deliberative polling with like core religious differences, belief differences that are not kind of like the kind of thing one can easily put their out on the table for discussion for others to access who don't share these uh, fundamental core faith traditions, right? So, so, so I, I'm asking, like, like, what about the role of religion? Some at least are firm people, religion. People bring their religious convictions all the time into the discussions, uh, uh, but, uh, but they do so knowing that they're in a diverse group. So they have to sort of retranslate them so others can understand and, uh, uh, and usually there are ethical claims that are mutually intelligible. I don't believe that Amy and uh, Dennis have ever actually done, uh, uh, done any experiments in deliberation. They've just written about uh, other projects. So uh, I wouldn't know how to police the, uh, you can't bring your religion into the discussion. I wouldn't know how to police that. People, people say all kinds of things. They tell stories about their experience or what they learned in church or rest, but they have to, because they're in a diverse group, they have to make it intelligible to people who don't go to their church or don't, uh, and, and, uh, and they do. They manage to open up and try to communicate um, sincerely to others, and it works quite well. So I haven't found um, any difficulty there. Yeah, let, let, me, let me point to an area um, 
where I think there may be a little bit of a unique challenge uh, in the bioethics context and just get your thoughts on this, okay? So you've done all your work, I believe, in, in um, political and public policy questions like energy and climate change that, that pretty much affect most of us, right? Um, so that seems to fit very nicely in a democracy theoretical uh, framework where those who deliberate have the moral legitimacy of what they believe or what they what they what is the output of that deliberation process because they're going to have to live with the decision somehow like it's kind of a self governance model. But in bioethics and many of the contexts that like the need for public participation comes up will be on, for example, very specific scientific issues like bench techniques that you know should we put human cells into an animal embryo. Okay, well, I can't think of an average American who will be affected at all by the outcome of that decision. But it's more like, like asking the public, what do you think about the morality of doing something? It's not really the same thing as asking, what do you think about a policy that could affect you as an American, right? It's not, it's not that kind of um, issue. It's more of like making a deliberative judgment about whether or not it's right or wrong to do something at the bench for which you may never, ever intersect with personally in any way. Um, is, do you think that's a problem for sort of, for translating or bringing this approach to a bioethics context? Well, I would select bioethics topics that have some public policy see, implication. See. You see where there are potential benefits and potential harms, um, and where uh, some of the benefits, you know, by <laughs> by. Uh, PA, philosophy PhD supervisor at Cambridge many, many years ago, Bernard Williams, uh, wrote an essay on, um, on the idea of equality where he talked really about, <laughs> yeah, oh yeah, he was, he was a marvelous, uh, marvelous teacher, uh, 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 where he talked about um, uh, if people could uh, select the genes of their, um, uh, if there was a method where the rich could select the genes of their children, how that would change the, uh, the uh, uh, he, it was just a sentence in there, but uh, how that would change our ideas about equality and should that be permitted. That got me thinking way back then uh, about that issue. But there's societal implications to the kind of society we have if the rich can purchase uh, uh, smart genes for their kids and the poor can't. Uh, so um, uh, it, it may not be a direct harm or benefit, but it may be an implication about the whole, the kind of society we're going to end up living in. Uh, so I, I would um, certainly begin the, 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 um, uh, the initiative in uh, bioethics where we can identify some public policy implications uh, 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 with the pros and cons or uh, the broader social implications of the kind of society we want. Uh, well, I think that's the perfect note to end our session. We are out of time. I really look forward to seeing what work you do in the area of bioethics. I'm really looking forward to that. Um, so I would like at this point to thank our audience members for joining us in this session. Our next uh, session next month will be on microfluidic uh, modeling of the human female reproductive system. So get ready for that one. Um, I'd like to thank Ashley Troutman and Helen Sethanitis for their help in organizing this session. I'd also like to thank the Center for Bioethics at Harvard Medical School for sponsoring this event. And again, thank you for joining us. Have a great weekend. See you next month. It's a great pleasure.